You're listening to the BBC World Service. Two earthquakes in New Zealand and in China this weekend have reminded us how dangerous some parts of the world are. But can we ever know where the next deadly quake will hit? That's the question for this edition of Discovery with me, Roland Pease. On March 11th, 2011, mid-afternoon, Japan experienced its biggest earthquake on record. For three and a half minutes, the coast shook violently as parts of the country slowly ground their way eastwards towards America by two and a half metres. I visited Japan shortly afterwards for the BBC to see what Japanese science had learned about the way earthquakes happen and to see how their preparations had matched events. Much of what I saw impressed me, but one comment has continued to haunt me. This is the National Hazard Map. This map shows that the most dangerous area in Japan, according to the government agency which produced this, is between Tokyo and Nagoya, Osaka and so on, off the Pacific coast. So it's all that that southern coast is coloured deep red. That's right. And, And this area is, according to the government, the most hazardous part of Japan. On the other hand, the earthquake of March 11th occurred in a place where the government labeled it very low risk. So what it is, if you think of weather forecasting, they forecast a very, very light drizzle. And what happened instead was the biggest hurricane, biggest typhoon in the history of Japan. So they blew it. American geophysicist Bob Geller has lived in Tokyo and worked at the university there since the 1980s and has long warned that the science behind the Japanese earthquake forecasting system just doesn't stack up. He was quick to remind those who would listen how badly it had let the country down in 2011. And since then, he's been joined by other experts in a swelling chorus warning that geology cannot deliver what governments and society demand of it. A reliable prescription for where the most dangerous seismic places on the Earth are, when the worst might happen, and just how much shaking it will deliver. There's nothing special about the Japanese approach. They may throw more money at it, but the methods elsewhere are much the same. I'm Roland Pease, and for this edition of Discovery, I've been talking to many of the critics of seismic hazard assessment, as it's called, and to its defenders, including Ross Stein of the US Geological Survey, a highly respected geophysicist who I've often turned to, and who agrees there is a problem underlined by the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. Tohoku is kind of a Rorschach test about seismology and earthquake hazard assessment. The Japanese have lavished effort on this money, expertise, that is among the greatest efforts any nation has ever undertaken, which is a testament to their desire to take this seriously. And in many respects, they achieve something that no one else has. They survived a huge earthquake, even though it was much bigger than expected. The amount of shaking was about what they expected. They survived a huge tsunami. The tsunami was much larger than they expected, both because the earthquake was larger, but even more so because it turned out it triggered a huge undersea landslide that no one anticipated and that we don't understand. So they were thrown to giant curves. Nevertheless, a loss of life under 20,000 people for an earthquake that large, for a tsunami that Uh, angry is a huge success so this is why it's a Rorschach test you can look at it and say no other country would have come off as well as they did and you can also look at it and say oh nobody made as large a mistake as they did because the earthquake was 20 times larger than expected If the 2011 earthquake was a single and singular failure in the hazard maps, it could be written off as a lone and bizarre oversight. But for decades, Japanese on the coast south of Tokyo have been told they live in the region most likely to be devastated by an earthquake. And they're the ones who so far have been spared, as critic Bob Geller is keen to underline. Actually, almost all of the other large earthquakes in Japan have have also happened in places said to be safe. So you can see, here are all of the various earthquakes that caused 
fatalities, more than 10 fatalities. And none of them occurred in a place that the government labeled as being dangerous. So what this is telling you, or at least telling me, is that the assumptions made in making that map are wrong, that earthquakes do not occur according to the theories that were used to make that map. I think we need to show humility in the face of the complexities of nature. We can't really say that, for example, there is the probability of an earthquake as if we could know that, or the earthquake hazard as though that was something we know. These are quantities we can only estimate very roughly. This is Seth Stein from Northwestern University, no relation of the USGS's Ross Stein, who has teamed up with Bob Geller to write a series of excoriating critiques of seismic hazard analysis. I think what has happened is people have made earthquake hazard maps not explicitly accepting the limitations on what we know. Not surprisingly, the answers are often bad. So Tohoku was a much bigger earthquake than they expected. The Haiti earthquake was much bigger than on the hazards map. The Wenchuan earthquake was much bigger than the hazard map. And this sort of goes on and on. And it basically what it was is there has been a f- tendency to overestimate what we know and discount what we don't know. Someone will tell you the probability of an earthquake is 34%. If you try to estimate it, you can probably say it's somewhere between 10 and 60% probably couldn't do much better than that. If you claim you're more accurate than you really are, then you're going to be wrong a reasonable amount of the time. I think the word crisis is appropriate. Another critic to join the chorus, Swiss seismologist Max Wiss, defending the title of a paper he published last year, Mapping Seismic Risk, The Current Crisis. For decades, there has been a method to estimate earthquake hazard And over these decades, there have always been individual scientists who said this method is not correct. But it was a minority. And now all of a sudden, there are many people who say this is just not right. A retired academic, Max Wiss now runs an NGO operation which advises humanitarian agencies on the rescue needs of victims in the aftermath of great earthquakes. Speed is of the essence, so that he needs to estimate from remote seismic detections not the magnitude of an earthquake, but the amount of shaking it has done and the amount of destruction that might have followed. His sense of the scale of failure in earthquake forecasting comes from running the scenario earthquakes in the hazard maps through his damage programs. I have a program that calculates actually in real time, within less than an hour, how many people are dead. That is what I do every day. So now I'm doing it for this case where we had an earthquake, let's say 10 years ago, and I calculate what would the result have been if the acceleration on the map had taken place. And yes, the answer is 200 people dead. In reality, however, it was typically 20,000 people dead. The difference between the fatalities that the map would imply and the fatalities that did happen in the 20 worst earthquakes during the last 20 years is a factor of 200. 200 times more people have died than one would have expected on the basis of the map. And so what do we say to this? Well, I I say this map is misinforming people. A century ago, geologists could be excused for not knowing why the ground shakes. With no fundamental model of how the planet works, earthquakes could easily be blamed on the anger of gods or such like. But now, half a century on from the development of plate tectonic theory, the underlying driver for seismicity is understood. Though, as Ross Stein accepts, the important details don't seem much closer to analysis. For the most part, the story is straightforward. We know that we have a dozen plates moving around the planet... They bump and grind along their borders. Those plates are rubbery, so stress gets stored and eventually they pop and we have earthquakes. And that story explains 95% of the earthquakes we have. We do have some bizarre spots in the middle of continents that we don't quite understand why they're producing earthquakes at all, but they do. But the problem is, when we zero in on any one spot, a spot that matters, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Tokyo, Santiago, Manila, Quito. Then 
the uncertainties about what has happened in the past and what will happen in the future outweigh the knowns. We don't have enough information to tell people confidently what's going to come next. So earthquakes are the planet's way of relieving the stresses where two plates grind against each other. In 2011, the compressed rocks bordering the Japanese coast on the Pacific floor snapped and the seabed ground its way under the island in a process they call subduction. Or in 1906, the Pacific side of the San Andreas Fault moved up to 10 metres northwards relative to the land, relieving stresses that had built up on century timescales and bringing devastation to San Francisco. What alarms Californians now is many metres of compression have now been squeezed back into that fault, which is why they all fear the next big one. The places posing the greatest threat, according to the simplest expectations, are those where the gap since the last quake is the longest, where the most strain has built up. But Seth Stein says that's not borne out by actual quake history. We've been working for about 40 years with the assumption that when, you ha- when we don't see an earthquake in some part of a plate boundary, that will be filled in sooner than in other places. And that's that, what you call the seismic gap. That's called gap. a seismic gap. People have looked at that and concluded that it actually doesn't work on any statistical basis. But it's when very it, seductive when it does seem... It to does, happen. but it's but again, it's very easy to see patterns and things that aren't... If you People have done this experiment statistically. They've, there was a famous gap that showed seismic gaps in red and supposedly safe places in green. And then you wait 10 years and try this experiment, and you conclude that the map does worse than random. And in fact, if you want to use the map at all, your best bet is to reverse the colors. It seems that there's just enormous randomness in the system. We can easily convince ourselves we see gaps. I mean, it ought to work because the, the, the tension is being ratcheted up in those rocks. The force is accumulating and at some point ought to break. And that's what is, it's frustrating. It's that's frustrating. Frustra- it ought to work. But one thing that we have to get our heads around is the Earth is not obligated to behave the way we would like it to behave. We can make bright colored maps and we can write computer programs, but they, in the end, end of the end, the Earth will do what it wants to do. Bob Geller, scourge of the Japanese quake forecasting scheme, is, if anything, even more scathing of this simplistic idea of stress building up on a single fault to breaking point. It's probably wrong. We don't have any idea how much energy is stored in the crust. And we have lots of examples where you have two earthquakes, bang, bang, in a reasonably short period of time in the same general place. So, in fact, earthquake occurrence seems to be rather clustered. Sometimes you'll have a couple of earthquakes that appear to be periodic and and other times not. So you can have anything and everything. We don't know, for example, how much energy is left in the crust after the magnitude 9 earthquake occurred. So, if they paid you to draw the hazard map for Japan... And I'm sure you'd want to do it with some proper research and detail and so Not on. Not at all. No? I, I would just log on to Google Earth and I, I would make a map of Japan and that would be my hazard map. Period. Bob Geller's case may be borne out by the failures of the Japanese hazard map, but there are counterexamples. The almost equally enormous earthquake in Chile the year before is an instance. It occurred on a section of the Pacific coast that had remained relatively undisturbed for 180 years. And in hindsight, many seismologists agree that in 2010, Haiti had been due a massive hit after a 240-year gap since the devastating shaking in 1770. But only a few had been agitating about the danger beforehand. We're easily seduced by these successes in quake science. I certainly am. Reassured that things have turned out the way we expected them to be. The oddballs, the black swans, the events that strike in unexpected places like Wen Chuan in China or Christchurch in New Zealand, those we can explain after the event by adding a bit more science. In a way, we think the failures make us more clever. Except the critics dismiss this as Texas sharpshooting, referring to the easiest way for a gunslinger to look like a good shot. You shoot at the barn and then you draw a target around the holes that you got. It might sound like a joke, but this kind of seismic pattern fitting is what has made seismologists look cleverer than they are, says Seth Stein. So you're convinced yourself that this is the pattern that you see. That's great, but then its ability to predict the future will tend to be fairly poor. And this has happened to us over and over and over again, where we've taken a very small set of data, 
drawn some complicated inference from it. The one that, for example, that I was heavily involved in was the prior to about 2004, seismologists had convinced themselves that you could only get giant magnitude 9 earthquakes where the plate going under the other plate, the subducting plate, was young and was going underneath very quickly, and hence there'd be very tight binding at the interface. This thinking permeated that in the Japanese authorities, that you couldn't have a magnitude 9 on Tohoku. So they said each individual piece of that trench could break, but they would break separately and in essentially a magnitude 8 earthquake. After the Sumatra earthquake that was a magnitude 9, my uh, colleague Emil O'Connell and I looked at this and decided that the whole pattern of where you could get magnitude 9s was just an artifact, that we had just seen a relatively small number of these because there's only about one every 20 years. So we said you can get a magnitude 9 anywhere, and uh, the Tohoku earthquake proved that that, in fact, was the case. A magnitude 8 would have given about a 10-meter tsunami. A magnitude 9 gave a 20-meter tsunami. The seawalls had been built for a 10-meter tsunami, assuming you couldn't have a 9. Seth Stein's critique started from the idea that our earthquake record is too short to make meaningful inferences. And certainly, although the official Japanese hazard maps had been based on what was known from the past few centuries, in 2001, some scientists had published evidence that a giant tsunami had previously inundated the northern shores in 869, over a thousand years ago. But this information hadn't been assimilated into the forecasts. Equally, the Haiti history was known, but not dwelt on. The Christchurch earthquake happened on what they called a blind fault, a fault in the crust that existed but hadn't been discovered. I met Ross Stein in a converted monastery in Pavia, where he'd invited me to the unveiling of new maps and datasets assimilated since 2009 by a new organisation, GEM, standing for Global Earthquake Model, which seeks to overcome these shortcomings in seismic science by deepening the knowledge. And it's my pleasure to introduce as first speaker Ross Stein. Ross is uh, one of the founders of GEM and he's one of the most uh, important driving forces within the GEM system and I'm not exaggerating. Welcome Ross. The fundamental problem of earthquake forecasting is to try to understand what future earthquakes will do based on past record of earthquakes. And the problem is that our record is very frail and very short. We want to advance the art and the science of seismic hazard assessment. We want to make it as reliable as possible, and for that we must enhance and augment the data sets on which this science is based. I believe that the global data sets that have been collected have simply raised the standard in every respect. Our ability to forecast future quakes from the very frail record of past ones will always be imperfect, but will always depend on the quality of the record of the past quakes. GEM has greatly enhanced the last hundred years of instrumental records and greatly enhanced the last thousand year record of historically recorded earthquakes. We also have shown that the straining of the Earth's crust, which is released in earthquakes, gives us another important proxy for earthquake potential around the globe. So the data will be extremely powerful in advancing our understanding. And I feel that to a great extent, data trumps all. If you give scientists and communities and governments good data, people will take that and make discoveries. They'll do a better job. They'll make this more reliable. This is the launching pad for enhancements in what we do. Openness is at the heart of GEM's operations. Openness so that anyone can participate. Openness so that anyone can see how the forecasts are constructed. And it was in the same spirit of openness that Ross Stein's fierce critic, Seth Stein, was also invited there. I don't think Ross and I have enormously different views on this, actually. Um, we start with the same body of information. There's no, there are no secrets in this business. We all have the same information. And I, I, think, I don't see that there are great differences of opinion here. A battle then fought with respect and pleasantries. But let's try one 
key question. If I were to magically come up with a thousand petabyte database of all the earthquakes in the past million years, how much better would we be then than we are now? Somewhat, perhaps not dramatically. Let's imagine that I had a 100,000 year record of earthquakes on the San Andreas Fault. Right now we have one that goes back about 2,000 years. And what we saw were extremely complicated patterns. Okay? It may very well be that those patterns do not give us enough information because there is such a high level of randomness. For example, if you look at the history of like 10 intervals on the San Andreas Fault, there's no obvious pattern there that we can do anything very useful with. It'll tell us some things. For example, we know that the biggest earthquake has to be at least as big as the last one we've seen. So, for example, had the Japanese you know, used their paleo tsunami data, or they would have considered the possibility of a larger earthquake than they considered. So a better record will help us some. Whether it will ever be adequate to fully characterize the probabilities of these events, my guess is probably no. We may be able to do somewhat better. So we are always better off with more data. We will always know more about the Earth. But there may be things, and I think there are things, that may very well be unknowable. In fact, Seth Stein's rather pessimistic prediction is that the best a better seismic science may give us is an understanding of why it will never yield the kinds of forecasts we demand. The optimistic view, taken by Thomas Jordan, director of the Southern California Earthquake Centre in Los Angeles, is that more knowledge will mean better foresight. He also believes that the behaviour of the Earth might help us see earthquakes coming. For example, we know that earthquakes cluster in space and time. If you have a large earthquake, you have aftershocks. We can use statistics of earthquake clustering to do short-term forecasting. And these methods can't give us high probabilities of having earthquakes, but they can uh, certainly allow us to understand how the probabilities of earthquakes are changing with time. So, for example, when we have earthquake activity here in California, say near the San Andreas Fault or some other big fault, uh, we get nervous because we know that during those sequences the probabilities of having uh, larger earthquakes are higher. Now, how much higher? Well, it turns out they can be a thousand times higher. And the forecasting models that we're using can give us that kind of probability gain, factors of 1,000. However, you have to remember that if you take any particular short period of time, let's say one week, during normal intervals when we don't have that type of seismic activity, the probabilities of having a large earthquake might be a 1 in 100,000. So if you increase that probability by a factor of 1,000, you're still only 1 in 100. So you'd need 100 events, clusters of that sort, before you'd expect one of them actually to result in... That's exactly uh, right. Therefore, when we get in those types of situations, we have to ask ourselves the question, what should we tell the public and how should agencies respond? That's a very new area. We call this operational earthquake forecasting. So we, we admit that we cannot predict earthquakes with any type of high accuracy, but we can monitor and see when significant changes occur. But we are always in a low probability environment, talking about probabilities that are much less than 10%, very often less than 1% in a particular short period of time. And, you know, frankly, we as a society haven't thought through what to do with that kind of information. Clearly, it doesn't provide the type of information we need for very costly actions like evacuating cities. So there's the dilemma. Normal seismic hazard analysis may tell you that you live in a dangerous region. It may take the form, there's a 30% risk the area will experience violent shaking sometime in the next 50 years, which is the best part of a lifetime. And of course, that also means there's a 70% chance it won't happen. And even if the probability is right, the forecast shaking might not alert you to protect your nuclear power plant with adequate seawalls. Or the operational forecast might tell you there's a half percent chance for a dangerous event in the next week. Is that useful? Do you evacuate a city 200 times because one of them might be the one? And don't forget that plenty of deadly earthquakes happen without any of the swarming activity that Thomas Jordan mentioned. That's the nature of statistics. Experts try to fill the gaps in our knowledge because we demand it. And Seth Stein has this parable of folly. There's a famous story by uh, Kenneth Arrow, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, 
And when he was in the Army, he was a weather forecaster. And they used to prepare these month-ahead forecasts for the Army. And then they looked at them statistically and decided their forecasts were absolutely no better than random. So they owned up to this, and they sent the general a memo, and they got the answer back. And the general said, well, look, I know these forecasts are no good, but I want them for my planning purposes. So even the general basically wanted to know the future. He wanted to know more about the Earth, the, the atmosphere, than meteorology was capable of telling him. So we, you know, we are worrying a lot about the Earth, but it's a slow process to understand something extremely complicated. But there is a very strong tendency to want to know more about the future, probably than the information that is available to us will be. So we really have to show this humility in the face of the complexities of nature and try to understand them as best we can. Which, in a sense, is close to the position Ross Stein holds, a sober belief that understanding the Earth and sharing what you learn has to make some difference. We have a compact with the public. We must tell them what we know, and we must tell them what we don't know. This takes skill and humility, because this is a humbling field. If you want to feel smug, don't go into it. If you want to make a difference, choose it. I'm Roland Pease, and you've been listening to Discovery from the BBC. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.